Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us today. I was expecting to meet to meet the rally and the nice venue for all things open. So I think this needs to wait for another year. Uh, uh, let's start with with the talk. Uh, the idea is to talk about OSPO. I, I assume you already know about the topic, but I would like to start just talking about software itself. And this is an old quote about software is eating the world. I think it was said uh, around 10 years ago. So a lot of things have changed, but during those changes, that has we have seen a lot of waves. I love surfing, so I will I will use this photo in many of my talks. Uh, but basically, it's all, all these technologies that are coming to companies are companies are adopting technology in many areas of of their own uh, corporations. And to achieve that, it's like okay, they started with big data, then came artificial intelligence, machine learning. Now we are talking about quantum computing. I I don't know what will be on 2021, but the interesting thing is. All these waves means that companies need to become a, an IT company. Companies are not anymore just banks or retail or whatever. They are becoming actually a technology companies providing banking or retailing services. And that's that's something of the first things I would like to, to highlight. Of course, the second thing is that actually it's open source is the one eating the software world. And this is a quote from IDC uh, analyzing the market, the expectations for the market for 2022. I don't know if this is going to be even faster given current situation now, all these discussions about digital transformation. But it's been said that over half of the code in 75% of the new apps uh, in, in any company will be from external sources because you are not able to build everything from scratch, the complete stack of technology. So you need to take pieces from outside. And that means that people are, of course, hiring companies to do some specific developments, but also people are and companies are taking open source from outside to incorporate to their own stack technologies. And that starts to get things more complicated from the management point of view of the company. And this is where this uh, name of OSPO, or Open Source Program Office, is becoming a, an important role in, in a company. So I would like to, first of all, discuss a little bit about what's really in, in an OSPO, what's, what's going on there, and what's the kind of people that are working there. And uh, when we're talking about OSPO, basically they are managing the relationship between the corporation or the company or the organization with the open source world outside them. So what's, what's that open source looks like, what that world looks like? Um, this is something I took from some friends in, in Uber when the OSPO office in Uber, they did this kind of presentation. And I, I like this idea of having workflows of open source, how open source is coming to companies or going from companies. So I see two clear workflows. One is inbound processing. So basically companies are consuming open source projects either because they are hiring companies to incorporate open source technology to their own stack or because someone in the company is taking uh, JavaScript libraries from outside to incorporate them to their own websites and things like that. But they are consuming at some point open source projects. And that's the clear inbound process. But there, is also, there are also outbound processes that are ready with contributing to open source projects. Companies are becoming to understand that contributing to open source projects at some point, specifically if they contribute to upstream projects, basically they are able to make the project to go towards they want that project to go. Basically, uh, one, I'll give you a clear example, for example. Samsung uh, has been contributing to a lot of uh, graphical uh, open source projects to make sure that once that their hardware reaches the market, there are already existing support in the software to make that ha hardware uh, works. Because if they need to wait for the software, it, it wouldn't be good for the market. And that's a clear strategy from the business point of view that they need that to happen. So they need to contribute to the project, but not only to contribute, they need to make that contribution to be part of the project itself. So that you know that that takes time. It's not a matter of I give you code and it's going to be accepted. They need to understand how that community or that project works and all that stuff. Another thing that we are also seeing our companies releasing open source projects. And that's also interesting because th there are many uh, strategies uh, that are already with this. One, of course, is, OK, there are components that we need to engage community to contribute and make probably that component a better uh, software piece for us. But another thing that I've been hearing lately is that companies are using these open source projects to attract talent in the sense of, OK, we have we are using these technologies in the company, let's list this as an open source project and people will start contributing. So we are gonna be able to see who are those core contributors from outside the company that we could hire at some point. And at some point, the company could be also seen as a cooler open source citizen in the world. So that's those are things that are happening when companies are using or contributing to open source. 
so basically it's the OSPO is the one managing all these relationship in the middle so so that's that's the cool task and usually when i hear about people in in OSPO, so in open source program offices about their pain points sorry their tasks is I've seen a, a very a very specific things. For example, when they are talking about consuming open source software, people there are people in the OSPO or some sort of OSPO because not all the companies has already this program office in place, but there are some tasks that are related with an OSPO. So let's think about that too. So there are things related with license compliance. Are we adopting open source technology that are not uh, compliance with our policies or are we changing anything and we are not taking into account GPL or other kind of licenses? Another thing when we are uh, adopting open source projects is, okay, and I, I, I'm uh, using an open source project that nobody's maintaining. How is the support of this project? Who is the one behind that? What's the health of this project itself? So basically, that's a, a typical question. Of course, there are questions related with security. I am adopting a technology that there are some flaws of or, or any backdoors in, in that, how I can check that. So that's also security checks. And another uh, interesting thing when consuming open source projects is and also uh, the way of, okay, this could be related with attracting talent. Because again, there are some pieces that if I am consuming them, the people making that software probably is also interesting for my company. So at some point, it could be also a way to, to attract talent to the company. If we are talking about contributing to open source projects, it could be uh, also different skills needed. Like for example, okay, if I need to make a contribution and I need that contribution to be accepted, at some point I need to be see as a leader or a nice contributor. So I need to check, okay, what's my leadership in the in the open source projects I'm contributing to? What's the footprint of the company in these projects? And, and you know that in, in marketing is it's used a lot this kind of quotes, oh, we are the top contributors to open source in the world uh, and things like that. But also you need to check, okay, I am giving code that is all the IP uh, on place or no worries about laws and, and things like that of issue. And, and uh, again, something that we, we have been listening lately, uh, lately is about talent rotation. The, the, this idea of if you allow your employees to contribute to open source projects, it's been said that they are more uh, engaged with the company they are contributing to because they are working for because at some point they feel, okay, I'm having an impact on not only on the things my company are, are doing, but also on the things open source ecosystems uh, outside. So that's also some kind of a uh, way to retain talent uh, or this has been said like that. And when they are releasing and maintaining open source projects, they are on projects. Again, they need to engage community. They need to ensure that the, the project is growing in terms of contributors, because if they are just putting up and that, you know, that's, that's that kind of things has happened uh, for a while or it still happens in some places is people put things on GitHub or GitLab and then, okay, this is open source. I'm going to have a community. No, you need to, to ensure there is some kind of community because if you don't get any community for that open source project, if you don't get any contribution from outside your company. It's not different than having the code inside your own company. So again, if you are releasing an open source project it's because you want at some point to see visibility and to see community, that's my understanding when you are doing open source. It's not only about marketing. It's also about creating this, these communities. Again, Things related with IP, intellectual property, again, things related with leadership, okay, how I am, I am dealing with the leadership of the place. And, and another thing, of course, this idea of I am able to attract talent through these projects because I can check nice or interesting people that could be for uh, to hire uh, in my company. And for me, the, the real pain point is how diverse are these skills? Because we are talking about things related with legal, we are talking about things related with uh, people, management. We are talking about things related with uh, engineering uh, and all this stuff. So the way I see open source program office people, I, I usually call them the rangers in the organization's open source ecosystem. And this is a concept that I've been thinking about lately. Is this idea of you as an organization are surrounded by all these open source projects because you consume them, because you contribute to them, because you release them. But those projects are fundamental pieces for your technological stack in, in your company. So if you are not taking care of your ecosystem, you are going to have some kind of troubles. Or that could be risky. There could be a lot of troubles around. So again, the OSPO are the rangers, the people that are taking care, OK, this ecosystem should be working perfectly. We should be avoiding any kind of bad behavior or thing like that, because we don't want to have that issues in our company, right? 
And again, as I, as I said before, the kind of profiles you need to manage or you have to at least have under this umbrella are very different. And I remember, uh, I think it was in a meeting a couple of years ago, asking, okay, how many people are, are working usually in these uh, open source program offices? And it was interesting to see, okay, for each, the number, the average number was like, for each 1,000 developers in my company, I have one person in my OSPO team. So that means a lot of potential travels happening because 1,000 developers able to do like contribute use or con release open source, you need at some point to, to have all these skills uh, managed. So again, it's not an easy task, but I think it is important. And of course, if you need help, I would like to highlight at least three communities, all of them uh, under the Linux Foundation umbrella that I think quite interesting for, for this idea of how to manage an OSPO. Of course, one of them is the to-do group. They are doing an amazing job uh, releasing guides and guidelines, best practices about how companies actually implementing open source program offices are working. Like Indeed, Salesforce, Google, GitHub, all these companies are already managing this situation. So they have guidelines there that I recommend you to read. So there are the link there for, for them. Another one is really, of course, with this idea of, okay, how I can ensure all the value chains, the software's value chains I, I put in place to produce my technological stuff, not only the, pro the products I, I put in the market, but also my own technological stuff, how I can ensure that everything is compliant, there is no flaws, how I can manage that. Open Chain is, is working on that, openchainproject.org, I, I recommend that. And last but not least, I, I would like to highlight, of course, one of my beloved projects that is, is Chaos Community, chaos.community. That Chaos stands for Community Health Analytics of Open Source Software. So basically the idea here is how I can measure, how I can see the health of open source project. So there are a lot of, uh, we have released or we have released on, on August, the last version, the latest release of metrics. I will recommend you to, to check them because they are very interesting ways to, okay, how I can see that there is real co uh, collaboration, there is fair play, how people are dealing with issues and pull requests, and all these metrics that usually people think about uh, are discussed there uh, through working groups. But also there are tools to measure that. And again, there are open source projects that you can already use there. Um, I will invite you to, to check that. But I would like to, to come back and, and to the topic of the, quest, the, of the talk actually, is this idea of open source software ecosystem. What that, that, does it mean? And why I would like to, to use the word ecosystem? Because this idea of everything is related at some point is it's not just you as the big corporation that is okay and the one managing all of this so because i have a very big name everybody's gonna do whatever i want no you know that that's not usually how ecosystems work and if you behave like that probably the ecosystem is gonna have some issues and for for, for me there are two main questions when we are talking about okay how is how i can manage or how i can improve the relation with this ecosystem first is What's the limited resource in your ecosystem? Because that's the very first point you need to take into account when we are talking about, okay, I need a healthy ecosystem. So I need that at least whatever is limited, I, I am aware of that and I'm able to manage that in a way that all the expectations are set about that. And last but not least, what are the risks we are facing about our ecosystem? Because if I take any decision, that is, uh, I need to understand what are the risks when we are taking certain uh, decisions. And I would like to, to talk about that later uh, because I think it's, it's quite important. And for me, and this is a personal view and that's part of the talk I would like to, to discuss and also hear your ideas, is the limited resource in, in the ecosystem is, is, is not the code. And there are many people just trying to put boundaries around the code or how the code is used. It's, it's about the people. Is we the people that contribute to, to make open source possible. We are the ones that could be burned out, that could be tired of contributing, that we can have, have issues, diseases, or things even worse that, okay, I cannot contribute anymore. And basically the, everything stopped. And the next question, okay, when we are talking about these people is who are the ones, who are the people that build open source software? Um, and usually the first thing that came to mind is, of course, is people and organizations that are people, of course, that are involved in free open source software. And people think, of course, in the people that are actually writing the code. And I would like to call them the maintainers, that people that are writing the code. But in, in my honest opinion, in my humble opinion, there are at least three kinds of people that are involved really in building open source software. And that level of involvement, usually I call them the active users. You could 
think about then about consumers, but I am thinking about people that is not only using the software, is they are also asking questions, they are participating in events, they want to know more about the software they are consuming because there is important for them. So they need to be active at some point in the community to make sure that everything is, is working as they want. The next level of involvement, I would say, of course, contributors. There are people that, okay, they have some technical background. So they basically they are able to solve that questions, but they're also able to provide patch sets or they are able, depending on the platform, you can send merge requests, you can send pull requests. I call them contributors. Of course, the names are are based on a, an old article I, I read and many people are using different approaches like the onion model and all this stuff, but that's what I like to highlight. And last but not least, the core of everything are the maintainers, because of course, there are people that need to write that code. They need to check that the patches they are receiving are good enough to be put on upstream and they need to be good to, to be released and, and all this stuff. So of course, maintainers are, are very, very important. And probably, of course, they are the most important part of everything. But all these people have involved at some point on making open source happen. Because someone said something in a forum like, OK, why not we do build this thing? And then a contributor sent a patch to change something in another open source project and take together two open source projects. And then they build something completely new. So again, you need all these three skills happening at the same time in the community. Because otherwise, you don't, have, from again, humble opinion, you don't have a community. You just have people writing code, and, and that's it. And I, I think we need to take this, all, all these people into account at some point. And the thing we have been hearing lately, and probably last year there were a lot of discussions about this, is that this is an unbalanced world between users, maintainers, contributors. This is, this is unbalanced. And of course, it's, it's very unbalanced world. And this is for, these are some charts I, I, I would like to, to show you about. For example, this is analysis I, I ran about Angular, React, and Vue all together, looking basically at Jet Hat numbers and taking into account like, okay, let's let's define this way. We, you will have users. So basically users, as I said before, are people, let's say, submitting issues. People that, okay, I am asking about uh, specific things that I would like to have uh, or solve or ideas or whatever. And you see there are around 200 people weekly contributing on these projects. And then you have the contributors that are those people answering these questions uh, or, or participating in the issues discussion or also sending pull requests. Um, okay, there are around 50 with some peaks, but I would say that there's very stable around 50. So okay, you see already see the unbalance. And then you see the maintainers, basically the people that is committing code. And they are very close to contributors. But you see all this unbalance here, all this space here is basically this idea, OK, people are also always asking for more things, and we don't have time for, for that. And that's, that's of course, uh, a weird situation that you need to manage. Or at some point, you need to set expectations of how the project works. But there are some cases that are slightly different. And this is Jitsi project, the whole history of Jitsi. And for example, here, it's not happening the same thing. Actually, users are very low compared with the number of contributors and maintainers. And actually, maintainers sometimes are even more people than contributors, except here. And you know what happened, happened to Jitsi uh, on early 2020, right? Everybody started using it. And then all these users appear because everybody, oh, this is not working. I need this in Jitsi. I need this feature in Jitsi. And this is typical burnout situation. Like, OK, I've been working pleasantly, very peacefully. Nobody was, has worried me. And then everybody is asking for things. Of course, there is, has been also a peak on activity. But this, again, creates this sense of burnout. You can also see when I think Atlassian sold the company and when they established the new company, all the, the decrease of activity there. So again, this unbalanced situation, how I can manage that. And I, I will talk that about that later. Because this is the other thing when we are talking about consuming and contributing open source software. Many companies or many people itself themselves, they are consuming and contributing open source without care because it's fun, it's easy, it's like jumping to the sky to dive. It's like, okay, very nice, I can do this because it's free. It's for free. It's open source and it's for free, so I can use it. I would say if you do it without care, of course it can be very funny, but it can be also very risky. And I, I, I don't need to highlight situations like secure, as I said before, security flaws 
all these problems about, okay, changes in the licensing, people contributing and not accepting my uh, contributions, like companies that are coming to play saying, okay, I have this big name, I have this 10,000 lines of code that's gonna solve your all your problems in the project and here it is, I set my patch set and then they receive a, yes, you need to check this and check that and change this and it's like, okay, I am, why are you treating my, me like that? And all these situations is where I think that one of the goals of any OSPO or any open source program office should be at some point to ensure the ecosystem sustainability because at some point our understanding that they are the ones managing these relationships with the projects and in their skills, there are people that know how open source work because probably not every company, not all the levels of the company, not every developer in the company might know how open source ecosystems and how open source communities work. They need to train or to at some point uh, just train the people in the company about, okay, how you need to use this, how you need to contribute to this and how you can be a maintainer at some point. And for me, it's a matter of understanding how you can do this path like from being a user like okay i'm just a company that basically i'm submitting issues asking questions in stack overflow or in the github repositories i am this kind of person or this kind of of, of company and if i will i would like to ensure the sustainability of the ecosystem at some point i need to start also behaving as a contributor to the ecosystem like okay let's start seeing how i can solve issues and i'm pretty sure that most of the companies using open source software has have people have people in in their companies technologically skilled enough to participate solving issues and also to answering questions and even to send patches like okay i've seen this easy to solve and it's not only about having hacked over first we could have hacked over first we could have hacked november first we could have hack December fest and have fest all the of the year round. So let's make that happen at some point. And then from there, if you start participating in the community in that way, things that we have seen is at some point people are accepted as maintainers because you are sending patches. You, you your code is, is good enough to be part of the of the project. So make that that happen. So let's start also reviewing and accepting the patches that the community is sending. Let's start coding the real thing and also discuss about the governance or this the roadmap itself. And, and that for me is where everything changes when, okay, me as part of the ecosystem, I am also deciding where the ecosystem goes. And that's that's something that I think is, is a long path, but I think OSPOS has all the knowledge and all the tools out there just to make this happen at some point. And of course, when we are talking about this, many people start thinking, oh, but to ensure the ecosystem sustainability is a matter of putting money on the table and paying maintainers. Of course, that's also a good point, and I would like to highlight uh, at least some options to make that happen. Of course, there are companies and, and ideas out there that building business models based on, okay, how I can make sustainability a business model for open source at some point. And Tideleaf and Open Collective are good, very good examples of them. Uh, I'm pretty sure you already know them. Foundations, open source foundations are becoming, uh, they have seen some kind of uh, potential business, but also this idea, okay, we are foundations, we have some kind of responsibility to the project. It's not only about membership, it's also about giving to the projects and sharing their sustainability. Again, I would like to highlight Software Freedom Conservancy is one of the foundations I love the most, but also Community Bridge Initiative from the Linux Foundation is quite interesting. Of course, if your company is able to do that, and I would like to highlight Indeed and Salesforce initiative, like, okay, why not uh, creating our own open source software funding initiative to sustain the projects my company depends on? And they, they have very nice papers published about how they are running this, how they are uh, checking which projects their people or the people working in the company is contributing to it, even in the spare time, because at some point, if that people is interesting for me, if I ensure that the projects they are contributing to are sustainable, every, everybody's going to be happy. It's a win-win situation. Why not supporting that? And of course, this this idea, of, I would like to, to call them, probably is not the best name, but this idea of JIG development, like tips or things like GitHub sponsors, Patreon or initiatives like that. Okay, you give a tip to a project. Probably that doesn't ensure the sustainability of the maintainer or the project itself, but of course it helps. But that's something to think about that if you're thinking about sustainability. But I would like to highlight one last option that 
not many people think about that. And is hiring is also an option. When we're talking about open source projects and usually all the discussion is about how corporations are doing things. And of course, when you're talking about free open source software, it's like, okay, I'm, me as maintainer, I'm putting the so software that for you under a license that said, this is the code as it is. There is no line in the license that says, I need to give you support. That's, that's the first expectation you need to understand when you are using or consuming open source software. It's like, don't expect the maintainer to do the job for you. That's the first thing. Of course, if he, he does or she does, Thank you very much. I, I really appreciate that. But I know the license I'm using, and the license doesn't say any anywhere in the in the license or in the governance. Usually says that this is how I'm going to support the project itself. And actually, the license itself says this is this code as as, as is, and that's that's very important. But there are a lot of companies, and there could be companies, and even for the maintenance, there could be a business model about okay, I can provide consulting, customization, support many ideas of how to build business models around open source software. I, I wouldn't call that open source business models, but you can call that if, if you want. But the important idea for me is like many companies, and this is something I, I personally have seen in, in some places, medium and big, comp and big size companies, they don't hire these people because they are too small. They have a lot of problems and bureaucracy to enter into the project. So basically they, they don't uh, end hiring them. That would be one thing. But the other thing that I have heard is like, but that, that that's a small project someone is maintaining. So basically we have all these developers in my company. I don't need to, to pay them. I can re rebuild from scratch all that technology. Like, okay, if it's not invented in my company, it's, it's not well enough. I, I call that the not invented here syndrome. Like many people see something interesting instead of they check it and then they they build their own stuff. I wouldn't say that. That's a very efficient way to, to advance, but there's another, there another way that I go and hire them, find ways to, to hire these people or these small companies to make all this, uh, build all this thing together. And again, that's, that's another way of creating an ecosystem. Like if we are all sustained at some point, we are gonna be happy and that's, that's very important. So some final remarks to, to end my, at least the slides and we can go for the questions and, and discussion. My final remarks is an OSPO manage something that is very complex and very diverse. That is actually the relationship between my organization and all the open source projects around it. And usually people think that that's just one, two projects. And I remember a, a talk from BBC that they, they have some BBC, the broadcasting uh, television in, in United Kingdom. Uh, they were they were so showing some interesting numbers like okay we have these two engineers in in, in a team and they are using these uh, three four open source projects and then they check then the number of people contributing to those projects so basically for them the the way they see they see this is we are not managing two people we are managing a team of actually 125 people for example one two of them are working for us and they are being paid for us directly but the other 100 23 are depending at some point of how we support them at some point because we are using that technology and, and we are contributing back. So that, that's one thing. And that again is not only about license or uh, people management or, or even engineering, it's about how I can be sure that we are all happy on this ecosystem. And because that means that you need to take care of that ecosystem because your sustainability and growth depends on it. And that's for me, is something that is this key to understand and it's, it's becoming more and more important each year that technology grows, that is coming more complex that at some point, I, I, I think at some point we, it's gonna be really hard to know what are all the open source pieces I am putting on place to make my banking account system because when we're talking about technology, it seems like it's by the, very, very direct. I have this, op, this I don't know, this ID solution or this process of solution or this uh, big data solution. So it's, it's using these pieces. But we are talking about service to people, like things like banking, retail, all these things that now people are thinking, about, okay, I need to do this online, all these technologies that are behind the curtains. There is an open source ecosystem at some point there, and you need to check all these things because at some point if that breaks that's going to create a lot of troubles and all this technology is built by people and 
Well, this being said, at some point, AI is going to be able to code. I, I would like to, to see when. I, I know there are some demos out there, but that things have been trained using already existing code or a people that has written code. And I, I, I like somewhere I read that, like software is something that is being written by humans to be read by humans and to be executed by computers. I think that was the quote more or less. And that's the important thing as at some point, a human should be able to check that or even to write that. So again, if you don't have people smart or people involved in the open source ecosystem, there's gonna, it's not gonna be any open source ecosystem at all. So again, hiring, don't forget that. Hiring is, a, is an option. Avoid, please, the not invented here syndrome. Go there, check which projects are, are you already participating, contributing, and using. And if it's possible, uh, it could be also an option to, to make that uh, happen. And I was expecting to 30 minutes. I want 30, 31 minutes now. So I think we have some, some time for questions. Uh, you have all my details there for, for contact, of course. But that would be my, my slides. And I'm open to, to answer any question you might have here. Again, you guys can post questions to Minri using the chat feature or the Q&A feature, or you can raise your hand. I think I can see who's connected, just to check. <laughs> Do I need to check the chat or? I think we don't have any question. <laughs> yeah, there is a question in the in the chat from Jacob Green. He says, thanks, Manrique, good talk. How many OSPOs are there? Wow, that's a very interesting question. Thank you, Jacob, for, for making that. Uh, the thing I've seen is that there are probably more uh, open source product office that people think, as I said in the beginning, like at some point, in, in at least in mature companies, I'm not talking about all the companies, but at some point in medium and big size companies, there are certain tasks like did with OSPO that uh, I've been doing by legal staff or even by hiring and um, what, sorry, uh, people management teams. And something I've been discovering lately is when I have talked with some with some uh, people uh, interested in the concept. Oh, I think we need a, an OSPO. They think like, okay, I need to talk with my engineering managers about why we should be taking this into account or how these things uh, could be put in place. And usually uh, they have very, I would say like barriers to make this happen because they see this like, oh, this is another complex thing to manage and we need to do that as an engineering team. My usual suggestions is uh, don't go there first, go to the legal area and ask, okay, do you know how how we are dealing with legal compliance for the open source place we are using, and then go to the uh, sorry to the people management pe uh, team. And do you know that we, if we will have this OSPO, we can manage all these things about attracting and retaining talent in very different ways. And this is where open start, doors start to open. About okay, let's create an OSPO because this this could also relax and and focus things on, okay, if we are doing this as an open source way and we are contributing and using open source space, we, we should be managing this at some point. And then it's when engineering can put in place to say, okay, if 
instead of creating forks of open source projects for my own thing, I can learn how to contribute back to these projects upstream, then probably things are going to be easier, more efficient, as where people start to learn about uh, next steps. So I would say that any medium company has all these kind of skills and happening at some point. But if you are asking about a specific number, I would say that To Do Group has a very detailed list of companies under OSPOS. And actually, most of the members in the To Do Group, you check the, the website, they have like a list of, I don't remember exactly the name, but the number, sorry, but there are very good names and very well known names there. But the thing for me is about when we are going to see non non born non technical born companies becoming uh, or having an ospo because this is where culture has changed at some point in these companies because uh, i mean microsoft or github or, or companies that are clearly technical companies are technological companies producing software or depending on software from day one they know that OSPOs matter and they have OSPOs and you can check that in the to the group uh, members list. But when you start seeing companies that probably their main business or is not related, I mean, it's related with software, but not with the services of selling or of that software, is when I see, okay, things are start to change in, in the culture uh, in this company. And that's, that's the, for me, the challenge. And that's, I would like to, to see more happening. I don't know if that answered your question, but I hope it helps.